Hello and good evening. It's good to be back with you again. This is Caroline, your host, and Hi, I'm very, very happy to, to, to be with um, you. Have you here? I'm here with us. So, hello. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling tonight? We are, we are definitely excited to have you as our presenter. So, thank you so much for joining our Stronger Together initiative and bringing this topic to us. And it's a real pleasure to be able to cooperate with you as well already. So uh, thanks for this. And I just want to mention that, of course, as you know, all the Stronger Together events have been brought to you. So we can support you. We can answer your question. And also, we want to give you that chance to simply um, meet top fertility experts and find out a bit uh, uh, um, all about what they are doing every single day, but also uh, to give you that opportunity to simply ask about your specific treatments and uh, we definitely hope that it's helping you as well and as you know we are here every single day our uh, stronger together initiative is coming to an end at least this year uh, but we are still have we still have some more events coming up so of course stay tuned and i also want to mention that tonight again uh, as this is a friday uh, we are supporting and we are promoting Greece as a fertility destination of 2021. And that is why Agni is uh, with us tonight. She is, of course, uh, located in Athens and she is mm -hmm. representing uh, Genesis um, Athens Clinic, which is a private general gynecological uh, clinic in Athens. And um, so thank you so much also for supporting this, of course. And uh, I also want to mention that uh, all those events um, we do have lots of help from our ambassadors and partners so huge thanks to everyone for joining us and for supporting and this is definitely very very important for us huge thanks for this and tonight definitely we do have an interesting topic uh, that agni has uh, prepared uh, to you she will start with her presentation and of course, afterwards, as always, it will be time for your questions. And our topic tonight is uh, is unexplained infertility, infertility always what it seems, and the role of laparoscopy in addressing uh, the IVF overuse. And let me just uh, mention that Agni Kantu, she is the physician surgical assistant, as I mentioned, at Genesis Athens. So once again, Agni, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. And well, are you ready to start with your presentation? Yes, of course. Thank you very I'm much for having to hear me. This. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be very happy to uh, have a speech tonight. So um, to explain you what infertility, unexplained infertility is. And as the topic says, um, is it always as it, what it seems? And what is the role of laparoscopy here in addressing IVF overuse? So, um, I'm just gonna go on with the slides. So first of all, um, to start, let's explain what, uh, let's understand fertility. So most couples will, will achieve pregnancy within the first year of trying with the greatest likelihood of conception within the first months. Uh, there is only a small percentage of around 5 to 7% of the couples who would conceive the second year. But it all depends on the age, of course. Um, so the definition of the infertile couple now, it's when the couple has been trying for a specific amount of time. Uh, if a woman is below 35, uh, lower than 35 years old, then the couple, um, they should have tried for one year. And if the uh, woman is uh, older than 35, then uh, it's six months uh, of the, the time, let's say, that the definition that within this time, then the couple is infertile or there is a problem at least uh, with their fertility, fertility related. The percentage of couples uh, with infertility is up to 15% worldwide, which is quite big. Um, so what is unexplained infertility now? So when the couple has been trying for the uh, time that I that I said already, the twelve months of with twelve months of unprotected in intercourse uh, for women lower than thirty five years old, or at least six months of unprotected women uh, unprotected intercourse uh, in women uh, more than thirty five, then um, they've been at, they 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 went for consultation at at this point. Um, 
as most couples do. They wonder what happens, what, what's going on. So the couple goes to the doctor and then the doctor consults them to go and have some specific uh, tests. And these are based on guidelines, the standard infertility investigation, which I'm going to explain you what, what these are. Um, and um, uh, this would be, I'm going to change the slide. Um, this would be three. So first of all, uh, it would uh, include a hormonal profile. So the woman should have uh, her hormones tested, uh, FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, estradiol, and progesterone at day 21. Uh, day 21 is uh, relative, depends on the cycle of the woman. If the cycle is a 28 day cycle, which is the um, mean uh, of the menstrual cycle, then she would have it at uh, day 21, the progesterone that is. If the cycle is a prolonged one and lasts for 35 days, then the progesterone would be tested a bit later, at day 28, for example. So it depends on that. Then the second uh, test, the second uh, um, procedure that the couple should go through is the to investigate the male factor, the semen analysis also known as the sperm diagram. And this would check for the morphology, the motility and the concentration of the sperm to see if and detect uh, of any male factor in fertility. Um, and then uh, last but not least and very important one is the patency of the fallopian tubes, the so-called hysteroscopography. So this is a test, um, it's a dye test and an X-ray, let's say, and it checks for the um, ab any abnormality seen in the uterine cavity, but also for the patency of the tubes. Are the tubes blocked, partially blocked, completely blocked? Is there any other um, abnormality like hydrosalpings? And then all depends on, on the results. They would go through uh, the next step, which would be uh, laparoscopy, for example, or hysteroscopy, if there is a polyp and so on. Um, so, Talking about the prevalence now, that being said, it is estimated that um, 15%, as I said, 15% of, uh, of couples do have infertility issues. 40% of these couples uh, are still are said to be unexplained with unexplained infertility because they've been through all these tests of the standard infertility investigation and they still haven't found unidentified cause. So that's why we call it unexplained infertility. However, 80% of uh, the patients with unexplained infertility with this title are found to have an unidentified cause, which is usually uh, uh, that being a pelvic floor abnormality. And I will tell you which these would be. Um, so the remaining of this 20%, 15 to 20% would be indeed with unexplained infertility. So what are the official guidelines, first of all, of four couples facing unexplained um, infertility? Um, there is a debate between physicians uh, with regards to the optimal management of unexplained infertility. Despite the fact that existing guidelines um, are given by official organizations such as um, you're the ESHRAID, the European Society of uh, Human Reproduction and Embryology, or the ASRM, American uh, Society of Reproductive Medicine, and others, of course, proposing the management uh, directions of unexplained infertility, the evidence is still unclear uh, because there is a lack of robust data. Uh, therefore, the couples and patients, and uh, for completion of one art cycle after the other, and uh, the mainly that leads to uh, and the no specific guidelines um, lead to really undesirable outcomes for example multiple IVFs and uh, like a mismanagement of their clinical practice uh, regarding their situation um, so what are the guidelines after all um, these would be uh, the National Institute of Healthcare uh, Excellence NICE guidelines for unexplained infertility endorse couples to go through the so-called expectant management and that would be trying to conceive 
um, naturally via unprotected intercourse for two years. So if the couple goes and the, the, the woman is below 35 and they've been trying for one year, then expectant management would be to try for one more year with unprotected intercourse or with timed intercourse or uh, checking the ovulation date and time and giving the physician would give them guidelines as to when to have intercourse. Um, the next step on that would be uh, to have uh, at least three or up to six intrauterine insemination attempts with or without protocol, uh, ovarian stimulation protocol. Um, and if this still remains ineffective, then the NIS guidelines recommends either IVF treatment or laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy, without having a clear guideline of where to go. Exactly, it's either or. And at this point, it's very important to note that um, there is inconclusive data um, regarding the appropriate management of women above 35 uh, years old. There's nothing really uh, specific above that age for unexplained infertility, I'm saying. Um, which path to go next? That's a very big question. And um, so first of all, couples with unexplained infertility, they tend to have a lower success rate following IVF in comparison to the couples who uh, with identified with an identified uh, infertility etiology, leading to multiple IVF cycles, as I said, and recurrent implantation failures. Um, they not, not necessarily risking to have recurrent implantation failures, I mean. On the other hand, laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy, um, permits an extensive screening of the pelvic floor, of the abdominal cavity, and of any pathologies in, uh, in, in the abdominal cavity. However, although it's a minimally invasive procedure, it's still invasive enough to, it's a surgery. So, um, there is the, the, the part that it is a surgery, it's an invasive technique. So since there is not, no clear cut guideline as to which step should the couple go through next, but only suggestions, then the specialist has its own subjective uh, opinion based on um, their clinical, his clinical practice and the wish of the couple. Um, so, as I, as I say here, uh, underneath the optimal management remains a conundrum. What could we find with laparoscopy? What is there to see? Uh, the recent studies on the value of diagnostic laparoscopy for infertility patients diagnosed with unidentified uh, etiology, I mean, demonstrate that un undiagnosed endometriosis, pelvic floor uh, adhesions, um, and uh, undiagnosed, uh, other undiagnosed diseases like pelvic inflammatory disease or um, tubal diseases like hypoplastic tubes, they can be seen with um, laparoscopy and all of these could be the reason for infertility, uh, the causes of infertility. From these, from all these pathologies, endometriosis is the most, most commonly seen um, pathology uh, that severely compromises fertility as well as the efficiency of IVF in a certain extent leading to recurrent implantation failure as, as uh, quite often seen. Um, so I'm not going to bother you a lot with what endometriosis is because I, I know that there are many colleagues that have already spoken about that but in general endometriosis what it is is the presence of uh, the functioning functioning endometrial tissue and stroma outside the endometrial cavity. There are little spots of endometrial stroma that have um, invaded either superficially or in depth um, the organs and the, the um, environment outside the uterus, outside the uterine cavity. Um, there, the procedure that it, this happens is it remains in a very big extent unexplained, but there are certain theories of um, the mechanical theory of uh, uh, backflow of the um, of the of the menstrual cycle backflow, the blood backflow, um, or uh, a very, to a very big extent uh, is um, idiopathic or uh, let's say the autoimmune system, uh, an autoimmune disease. So. 
it affects 10% of the reproductively healthy women. Uh, 20 to 20 percent of these women uh, are remain asymptomatic. Um, the gold standard for diagnosing is for diagnosis is diagnostic laparoscopy. It's not an ultrasound or an X-ray. It's just diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, the treatment for that would be uh, while doing diagnosing, while doing the diagnostic laparoscopy. There is also the treatment immediately. Um, and it, the treatment, however, remains controversial, um, and that's why many couples are misdiagnosed and mis mismanaged as an explained infertility patients, although they, they do have uh, a cause that would explain their infertility. Um, so, risking IVF overuse. Uh, the signs and symptoms of endo endometriosis, as I said, mainly is pain. Um, only one in three or one in four women has no pain. Uh, so mainly there, is, mainly there is a menstrual cycle pain or non-cyclical pain. And the second would be infertility. And that's why women who have no pain, then they come across with that disease or they are confronted with their infertility issues. Um, and th this is when they actually realize that there is something going wrong and they have endometriosis. Um, the how how does endometriosis cause infertility so well first of all it does cause adhesions uh, the tubes are abnormally um, they're they're altered uh, the motility of the tubes is altered the tubeovarian relationship is altered so imagine if uh, the anatomy it has changed um, so how would um, the egg and the tube find its way to pick it up from the pelvic floor. Um, also, there is an alteration in the systemic, uh, altered systemic immune response. There are macrophages and cytokines and uh, anti-endometrial antibodies being uh, released. And all of these would cause um, impaired fertilization and a compromised uh, quality of the oocyte. And so the embryo would be also compromised. Uh, its quality would be compromised. And then last but not least, are very much seen the corpus luteum deficiency the hormones are, are, are affected and so there could be impaired implantation so um, if there is no checkup of the hormonal level during um, the first weeks of pregnancy to see if the supplements are needed of estradiol progesterone then there could be um, an abortion early stage abortion or even before that impaired implantation um, so the classifying endometriosis, um, there is a, uh, there there is a, there are different types of categorization of, of endometriosis. The, for us, the physicians, we mostly use um, the, the the classification of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, but it would be too complicated for you to understand. Uh, that's why I've put the classification of um, the Endometriosis Foundation of America. Uh, which classifies as endometriosis by its anatomical uh, location within the pelvis and the abdominal, the abdominal cavity. Um, so we have category one with peritoneal endometriosis. So spots um, of endometriosis uh, in the peritoneum, um, uh, which uh, uh, is seen as black little spots um, in the Douglas space, the cul-de-sac. Uh, the second category would be um, would affect also the, the ovaries. Uh, there would be, for example, ovarian endometriomas as well as the, as, as the spots seen in uh, different uh, places in the pelvic floor. Um, uh, category three would be deep infiltrating endometriosis. This would be this form of deep um, infiltrating endometriosis involves organs within the pelvic cavity. And that, that would include, for example, the, the rectum, the uterus, um, and um, in some cases, cases, it would cause a frozen pelvis when all the organs um, are kind of stuck together because of adhesions uh, that they're, um, they're formed because of endometriosis. And then category four of deep infiltrating endometriosis. And um, that would be uh, an extreme form of deep infiltration of endometriosis involving the organs, 
both within and outside the pelvic cavity, uh, including the bowels, diaphragm, for example, the liver, it's a, um, even the brain, it's a, a, the, the biggest mm, level of, of uh, this disease. Um, so going, moving on, um, I'm just going to quote two, uh, two um, sayings of the organizations of ASRM and uh, ESHRE, um, saying that uh, laparoscopy is indicated when there is evidence or strong suspicion of endometriosis, pelvic adnix, uh, and adnixal uh, adhesions, so that is adhesions, for example, in the tubes or around the adnexa, uh, or significant tubal disease. Laparoscopy should also be considered before applying aggressive empirical treatments involving significant cost and potential risks. And Estra saying, Estra saying, there is a still considerable debate regarding the place of laparoscopy for cases of unexplained infertility. So uh, I'm, I've just pointed out um, these two uh, uh, quotes um, so that you understand that how big the debate is um, still out there. Um, so it has been voiced, as I as I write here, that uh, laparoscopic surgery should not be part of the standard infertility investigation, the operating protocol for endometriosis, I mean, related infertility, especially as therapeutic benefits of the intervention cannot be foreseen or guaranteed. Uh, so the patients with unidentified infertility etiology may be treated with IVF in general, despite the fact that several studies do indicate that these patients may have a strong potential to achieve natural conception following a thorough conclusive and definitive, definitive infertility investigation. Um, I'm going to show you um, right next um, a, a study that um, we published by the research team uh, of Genesis Athens Clinic uh, and uh, in uh, cooperation with the Medical School of the National Kapodistrian University of Athens, uh, which aimed to explore the effectiveness of diagnostic laparoscopy on women presenting with infertility or of an uh, undiagnosed uh, etiology according to the standard infertility investigation I mentioned earlier and recurrent failed in vitro fertilization attempts. So what we had in this study, this was a prospective cohort study. There were 107 women who took place in, in this study uh, with a history of at least three IVF um, attempts. That's the definition of recurrent implantation failure in a way, and a baseline elevation of CA one to five, which is a, a marker um, which could be um, still in normal ranges, but the higher normal uh, uh, value within the normal range would indicate, but only indicate, um, suspicion of an underlying uh, disease, such as endometriosis or inflammation in the pelvic area. So all patients underwent laparoscopic surgery on the grounds of, of um, further infertility investigation. Um, there were, of course, different criteria for these patients to be recruited in the study. There were inclusion criteria, the age, primary infertility, good standard infertility investigation, and as I said, the at least three IVF attempts with good quality embryos. And then there were the uh, exclusion criteria of chronic endometritis, autoimmune disorders, Etc. Etc. Male factor infertility. Etc. Um, so, following the identification and correction of endometriosis and pelvic adhesions, the patients were invited to conceive naturally. And for the patients that the laparoscopic investigation failed to reveal any pathology, then they were categorized as unexplained infertility, and they had the uh, they were subjected to a single uh, IVF cycle. Um, that's what I said. I, I'm sorry I didn't change the slide. So what the results are um, were uh, 62 out of the 107 patients were diagnosed with endometriosis. And of course, as I said, they were invited to conceive naturally. Um, that is 58% of these patients. Imagine how big this percentage is 
uh, more than half of the of the women um, uh, 30 out of 62 so 48 uh, percent successfully conceived naturally within the first post-operative year and uh, we should note here that when I mean with the first operate post-operative year most of the patients the majority of this group of patients achieved a pregnancy within the first six months 28 out of 30 uh, so 93 and a half uh, reported live births 25 uh, cases out of the 107 patients uh, were diagnosed with uh, adhesions and were invited to conceive naturally and from them 11 were um, did achieve a natural conception and then the remaining 20 cases was a subgroup of unexplained infertility and they proceeded as I said with the single IVF cycle 20% uh, of these patients did achieve, uh, after all, uh, clinical pregnancy. Um, here there is, a, there is another study, um, similarly to the previous one, uh, to the previous uh, prospective cohort study, where we um, investigated uh, couples with mild male infertility and recurrent implantation failure. Um, what uh, the, wh where we concluded is that uh, indeed the mild male uh, factor infertility is not related to recurrent implantation failure. Therefore, we suspected an underlying pathology in, in the women and um, who had no symptoms or infertility related female factor following the standard infertility investigation. So following a consent form, all women were subjected to diagnostic uh, laparoscopy. Uh, the results are here, where uh, following uh, laparoscopy, 43 patients were diagnosed with endometriosis, so 42.5%, 40, uh, 22 with adhesions, and uh, 36 laparoscopic investigation uh, cases uh, provided no further diagnosis. Um, uh, here is another uh, research um, by uh, Dr. Simopoul and her colleagues demonstrating the same uh, statement. And uh, um, in, the, in the research, in the article, uh, it, there is the saying that, I, that I've put here on the slide, um, failing to timely diagnose endometriosis to these patients and instead treating them, treating them under the umbrella of unexplained infertility is an ultimate risk. And it would be because these patients would keep on having IVF after the other, after the other. And to a very big extent, um, that would happen. It would be a, just a recurrent implantation failure and IVF overuse. Um, so uh, another um, article, I'm showing articles and publications because uh, evidence-based medicine is uh, uh, the way that uh, physicians go go uh, through um, it's it's how we um, uh, conclude how we have basic uh, uh, robust data I I'm sure that um, many physicians would agree that there is a lack of robust data here in this case of unexplained infertility but at least some that I would really like to show you um, are these so another one is by Dr. Sara Mustafa um, published in 2020, illustrating again the fact that recurrent implantation failure has an incomplete understanding and pointing out the significance of diagnostic and therapeutic challenges such as the use of laparoscopy. And as stated by the article, with a likely benefit to embryo implantation, the use of laparoscopy might be considered to identify it and treat otherwise undiagnosed endometriosis. Um, last but not least, um, to conclude, basically, um, Nice points out um, that if a woman has been diagnosed with unexplained infertility, it means that no reason has been found to explain her infertility, which is true. However, shouldn't we really establish, uh, after all, when and after what sort of investigations we diagnose someone with unexplained infertility? That is the big question that there is out there. 
And um, I would like to close with that, with that part of the, of the article here in the Journal of Reproduction and Infertility by Mohammed Reza uh, Sadehi, published in 2015, saying our inability to find the, cause, the causes of couples' infertility does not mean there is no cause of, of, for the disorder, which is very much true. Um, the questions that arise after uh, all this investigation um, are the following. Why do we insist in IVF overuse in patients with unexplained infertility when there is still the last resort for, of concluding diagnosis? What if we can employ laparoscopy to explain the unexplained? Wouldn't such an approach put a limit in IVF overuse and in recurrent implantation failure? The data, data suggest that diagnostic laparoscopy may be beneficial for couples presenting with unexplained infertility and or recurrent implantation failure, leading to live births, even with natural conceptions to a very big extent. Um, so the potential role of diagnostic laparoscopy should be further investigated in patients presenting with, um, with uh, uh, such infertility case in order to avoid IVF overuse. Uh, on a very important note, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, a need of robust data indicating the possible role of diagnostic laparoscopy in patients presenting with unexplained infertility and reef to avoid the overuse. So I hope um, that was clear. I would really like to thank the research team of reproductive uh, physiology, the laboratory physiology of the medical school of the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens, with the head being uh, Professor Dr. Mara Simopoulou, and Dr. Kostandinos Pantos, the head and director of Genesis Athens Clinic. And I would be happy to answer uh, any of your questions. Thank you very much for listening. presentation with a lot of detail. Thank you a lot for that for sure. And well, uh, as you probably can see, there are plenty of questions ready for you. So Agni, are you ready for uh, to answer them? Of course. <laughs> then, of course. Let's go ahead with the very first question right here from Anne. I know that I have partially blocked tubes and endometriosis, but hydrosalpings was never mentioned. Should I further investigate on this after four failed ICSIs? So um, it depends on what we mean by uh, partially blocked tubes. Is it one of the tubes is blocked or is it blocked and under pressure they open? Um, how do you know by fact that you have endometriosis? Is it because of the pain? Or because, as I said, the golden standard for diagnosing laparoscopy is uh, uh, diagnosing endometriosis is diagnostic laparoscopy. So we can never be sure. However, if they've if you've been through um, four failed uh, IVFs, ICSIs, and embryo transfers, I, I assume that you've been through uh, embryo transfer as well or was the failure before that? I mean, there are many different factors. Uh, was there an implantation failure or were the ICSIs uh, that have failed, the fertilization stage that has failed? Because there's also the genetic factor, for example. Um, if, if there was hydrosomping, then uh, the doctor for sure, he would suggest it, he would have suggested to remove the hydrosomping as it's a very big, uh, uh, factor to fail. Um, and there is a follow-up right here as well. Delay flow through uh, and had laparoscopy. So if you had laparoscopy, I assume um, the endometriosis was uh, diagnosed and treated by cauterization of the spots. And it depends on how big the extent was of endometriosis. Then there is also a... Um, um, how's it called, <laughs> uh, a stop of the period, let's say, to eliminate all the very small spots that the doctor, the surgeon cannot see curing kind of the disease. I, I know that I have partially blocked tubes and uh, that's the first question. So um, if you've already had a laparoscopy, then you would not have a laparoscopy again. And if you had, if you would have hydrosalpings, then it would 
you would have seen that the doctor would have seen that endometriosis should have been cured so um to uh, the biggest extent so i assume there are also other factors that you should check as well and wonderful thank you so much for the very first question and and of course uh, agni thank you so much for explaining and uh, providing the answer to this question and as you can see there are plenty more questions coming up so let's have a look at the next uh, question that we have right here can pelvic inflammatory disease only be found via laparoscopy are there other tests so it depends on how pid is uh uh um, experienced, uh, if there is a, uh, if, if there is an acute inflammation, um, uh, so the, the, the patient would have a uh, big pain, for example, some salpigitis, um, if, um, uh, in general PID, yes, uh, uh, if it's chronic, then it's only seen, uh, under, uh, laparoscopy, um, ultrasound would suggest only a suspicion of adhesion or uh, hydrosalpics could be seen. Uh, however, uh, if there are no symptoms at all and just a chronic uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, then it's only seen by laparoscopy. Depends on the if it's acute or chronic, the pelvic disease, inflammatory disease. And wonderful. Once again, thank you a lot for yet another answer. And let's have a look. Next question is like in two parts. So let me go to the first part. I am 35. I have had five fresh IVF cycles with my fifth leading to a chemical pregnancy and one frozen embryo transfer. I had a natural ectopic after my second IVF failed and had laparoscopic surgery and was told I have endometriosis. I have another laparoscopy on Wednesday and I have three embryos frozen. What frozen embryo transfer protocol would you recommend for endometritis? Uh, please, sorry. I assume it's endometriosis. <laughs> yes, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there is also endometritis, which is another thing. Um, so for sure, the, there are many, many, many questions that uh, a doctor or physician would ask the patient to have a full picture of, of their uh, the clinical history. It's very important to have a conclusion and have a certain answer. Um, so I assume that you have another laparoscopy because of the natural ectopic pregnancy. Um, I had a natural ectopic pregnancy in my second IVF fail and had laparoscopy. I know you had already the laparoscopy for the ectopic. So I assume you have another laparoscopy as a diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, have you had the salpigectomy after the ectopic pregnancy? Oh, there was no need for that. I assume you had a salpigectomy to treat endometriosis. And I assume that you had a salpigectomy. So... Um, so in that case, there's always a bigger chance of having another ectopic pregnancy if there was already one. Either way, there is a, a little increase in the uh, percentage of an ectopic pregnancy after IVF, but um, to a bigger extent, if you've had already a history of an ectopic pregnancy and salpigectomy. Uh, however, um, if endometriosis is there, uh, you would uh, go through another IVF attempt and it would be best if you also checked if you haven't done so already the um, uterine cavity if there is some sort of endometritis which is checked um, um, via biopsy of the of the, um, uh, the uterine um, cavity um, and if there is endometritis there are certain antibiotic uh, protocols that uh, are used and they're out there to treat that before the next embryo transfer takes place, at least to increase the chances that everything is all right in the uterine cavity. Um, and I assume that you've checked also the genetic factors as well. Um, if I can help further with a uh, uh, answering uh, the question uh, at another point, I would be very happy to discuss your history in general. 
And of course, thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, one more, okay? Why am I more prone to another topic? Yes. Um, as you have already had an ectopic uh, pregnancy, um, I'm just saying that there is a, a slightly increased risk to have another one because um, of having the ectopic pregnancy in the first place. But it all depends on why you had the ectopic pregnancy. Was it because of salpingitis, chronic salpingitis, I mean? that has changed the morphology of the uh, tubes or um, uh, was it uh, uh, that it just happened because there's always a risk of an ectopic with IVF. You're a bit more prone in case of salpingitis. So I guess with the laparoscopy that you will do soon, they will check um, the pelvic floor and then I would highly suggest to check for endometritis as well. And wonderful. Once again, thank you a lot for that. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> I got the follow up. So they did not know I had a HSG, HSG and both tubes were fine. Mm -hmm. The tubes could be fine. And the hysterosopigography, uh, if the tubes are fine, they, they it, it will show that they're open. But um, if there is an alteration in the epithelium of the 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 epithelium of the tubes, this is not shown via this salpigography. It is, um, it could happen because of a, um, a, a pelvic inflammatory disease or uh, some sort of infection from the genital tract that alters the epithelial cavity. So colpitis, uh, trachylitis, endometritis, salpingitis, everything is kind of related. So if you've been through some sort of infection at some point, um, not even an infection, I'm, I, I don't necessarily mean an infection such as uh, uh, ureoplasma or mycoplasm, uh, which uh, it could be all as well, but um, um, in case of that the, the, the flora is uh, disturbed, then the naturally um, existing bacteria that we have in our epithelia, in the epithelium, in the epithelia, they could even cause a chronic endometritis, a chronic uh, inflammatory state. Um, so I would suggest, I would say that having a, um, uh, a little sample from the uterine cavity checked to see if the flora is okay um, or not, that would also um, trigger the idea that maybe there is an inflammation that has gone through with your tubes and uh, if possible treat it with antibiotics there are different problems out there perfect thank you so much of course for yet another um, answer and of course for all the questions and follow-ups here as well and um, indeed and there's a thank you from Daniel mm -hmm. for you as well and as we are in ta we were talking about a topic uh, actually there is another question so let me go straight to this one and of course we will go back to the previous ones mm -hmm. uh, is there still an increased risk of a topic with IVF after a topic even mm -hmm. where the tube was not removed if yes does IVF cause the increased occurrence of a topic just for that round or for natural attempts also following IVF, I don't have any known reasons for ectopic. Uh, can I say the question again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> right here. Is there still an increased risk of an ectopic with IVF? Yes, after um, after ectopic, even when the tube was not removed. Yes, um, there is always a chance of an ectopic. Um, the, there's always a chance. There is an increased risk of an ectopic pregnancy after IVF. And that is because when we do the embryo transfer, to a very big extent, the embryo goes, because the tubes are open, the embryo goes from the uterine cavity. Uh, there is a chance that it goes through the salpinx. And then the salpinx and its layer pushes it back to the uterine cavity with the cilia. If the cilia in the, in the epithelium of the tubes is, are affected, then the embryo is stuck in a, in, um, between the cilia and the affected, the affected um, layer of the, of the tube. And this is how ectopic pregnancy happens. Um, if you've had an ectopic and it, the tube was not removed, the risk is again the same. Um, that you could have again an ectopic pregnancy. Um, does IVF cause increased occurrence? Yes. 
for that round or for natural attempts also following IVF. Um, I don't understand the question, natural attempts also following IVF. Um, maybe you mean natural, a natural conception? Um, there is yes, Karen. Yes, uh, Karen, if you can just clarify that for us, okay? Just to make sure. Yeah. And someone is typing, so let's give it a second and see, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's Karen, but um, <laughs> it's possible. So I just need a minute to have a look at it. <clears throat> okay, yes, there's a follow up. Let me show you. Just when you said IVF increases ectopic, I wondered if this meant for any attempts, natural following this. Uh, there is, uh, if there is a, a, an affected tube because of uh, uh, an inflammation, there is still, uh, or endometriosis or adhesions uh, surrounding the tubes and uh, ch changing the tube ovarian morphology and uh, texture, there is always an increased risk, yes. IVF just has its own risk of an ectopic because yeah i hope i i was uh, being understood but i can always explain further well, of course thank you so much thank you definitely it's all good and explained right now and there is a thank you yeah. for explaining from karen for you as well and let's have a look okay we will go back to the previous questions mm -hmm. that we received and here's the next one my doctors all told me that ivf bypasses endometriosis but my understanding now is that endo can lead to both poor quality and failure to implant after three fight transfers with poor quality eggs i am finally getting treatment for endometriosis gnrh uh, suppression what else can i do to make implantation more likely after the suppression so, uh, yes, as I said, endometriosis does cause um, poor uh, quality of um, the oocytes and a poor, poor fertilization rate, poor implantation rate. Um, it, IVF does surpass, does bypass the endometriosis to a very big extent because um, it's not necessary that it it would cause a poor quality of the oocytes. Um, and uh, uh, with the uh, supplements um, of uh, estradiol and progesterone in case of the corpus luteum deficiency that is caused from endometriosis, then um, implantation, if it takes place, it could be supported. Um, so there is a small percentage that endometriosis affects even IVF, not a, a big percent. That's why your doctor has told you that IVF surpasses the endometriosis, um, but it does. And as I said in the presentation, um, after certain attempts of IVF, then instead of going through another and another and another, uh, psychologically wise, um, uh, body-wise and cost-wise, uh, it doesn't make any sense because there should be something there, uh, an underlying disease such as endometriosis that should be cured. Um, so a laparoscopy to investigate everything would be suggested, but it all depends on the age. If a woman is um, uh, 40 years old and older, for example, um, it, it could be suggested again to have laparoscopy, but then there is uh, also the uh, poor quality of the eggs because of age. So it depends on, we put many factors together to make a conclusion and suggest patients to go through laparoscopy. Not all patients go through that. Mainly women, um, mostly of young age, but of course women after recurrent implantation failure of a higher age, but the hormonal profile is very important to see that is fine. You know, we would not suggest laparoscopy to everyone. Uh, so you're getting treatment for endometriosis by suppression. Uh, so I assume by that you diagnose endometriosis how? With laparoscopy? Or they just give you suppression without laparoscopy? This is also... Here's the follow-up right here as well. Yeah, so wait for this for laparoscopy in my country is over nine months currently and not available privately. Suppression is my only option at the moment to move forward. 
So if I can help you with an answer here, I would ask what your age is. I would ask how the hormonal profile is before suppressing. Is the AMH fine? Uh, the anti-mullerian hormone? Is the ovarian reserve okay? Because suppressing also for a few months could suppress even more the um, hormonal levels, and that would be also uh, not as good, uh, even if you would go for IVF later. Um, I, I would ask all these. I don't know if we can answer these questions now. I would be happy to answer, but... Of course. Thank you so thank you so much. And I just want to mention that, of course, if you would like to get in touch and get some more mm -hmm. details, it is also definitely possible. Uh, I will send you a link in a second. Just mm -hmm. uh, give me a second and I will send it. And there is an option to connect with uh, Agni and her team. And I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you out with some more details uh, as well, of course. OK, mm -hmm. um, just let me have a look. Okay, yeah, so the patient has just wrote that uh, I can follow up with you later. Then, of course, as I mentioned, of I will course. send you the link. Feel free to get in touch, and I'm sure that way you will get even more uh, details. And, uh, of course, it's always the case that uh, Agni will need more, more of those as well. And mm -hmm. um, let's go back to the question, uh, sorry, to the previous patient, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's from Danielle. If I can speak to my consultant before my laparoscopy on Wednesday, should I request they take a biopsy while there, being there? Is there anything else to ask to complete? While well, in there. Um, so this is the previous patient with the, uh, yeah, the laparoscopy yes. on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So was there a hysteroscopy done? The hysteroscopy is very important to see that the cavity is fine um, and check for endometritis. So what I would suggest is uh, since you, if you haven't done a hysteroscopy at all and you've done uh, four embryo transfers, so, you, so hysteroscopy was done, I assume, and everything was normal. So um, if hysteroscopy has been done, then I would still suggest to take a little sample from the uterine cavity with a biopsy and send from the microbiome to see um, that everything is also fine from there, Be certainly before, before you uh, go ahead with the uh, next, the fifth embryo transfer. So this way you would um, you would cure the part of endometriosis if, if they're still there, check the tubes, and at the same time, um, you would wait for the result to be out of endometritis um, and so suspicion of salpingitis and have a course of antibiotics. Um, but this is always what a protocol uh, we follow. So different doctors have their own protocols uh, I can just give you a suggestion of what we do. Oh, of course. But indeed, thank you so much for that advice again as well. And I have just sent you the link. So there is an option to ask your questions. And this is always forwarded to, uh, the, uh, to the team and Agni, of course, as well. And sorry, there is a follow-up from Danielle. Uh, let me just have a look. So doxycycline I have taken on each cycle for 10 days, two times a day. Uh, Yes. Um, however, chronic endometritis needs a long um, uh, uh, taking of antibiotics. Um, it's a, a quite a long protocol and it's difficult to, to cure and it's on, not only for uh, a couple of days. Um, so uh, mm, also check the uh, microbiome with probiotics to make sure that lactobacilli are okay. I think better than going um, kind of uh, blind. It's good to have uh, everything fixed, everything uh, investigated. So uh, I would say that uh, together with laparoscopy, yes, you could have a, a little biopsy and scent to see if there is a, a underlying uh, um, inflammation of the uterine cavity, but I'm sure the laparoscopy would would have a good picture of what's in, what's going on in the pelvis, and then always take the other factors um, uh, in front of us to see if the genetic wise is fine, 
uh, the male uh, factor is okay, if the sperm has a problem, um, and uh, if so, cure it, the DFI, DNA fragmentation index of the sperm, that also has a very high, uh, uh, increases the risk of a failed uh, uh, IVF attempt, even ICSI attempt, implantation, I mean, attempt. And thanks a million for yet another question and, of course, for your help with this. All right. And again, there is a thank you from Danielle for you. And let's mm -hmm. have a look at the next question that we have. It's a short one this time. What is the success rate for donor eggs and good quality sperm at your clinic? So I would say 75% uh, uh, success rate. 75%, yes. Well, with donor eggs and good quality sperm. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for this. And next question is, so do you find that there are any common dom the dominators of women with Greek origins, such as myself with endometriosis, subserosal fibroids when doing IVF cycles and still miscarriages or no uh, pregnancy? So when doing IVF cycles and still miscarriages? Um... I don't think that Greek, Greek women, Greek origin, uh, have a bigger, to a bigger extent endometriosis, or at least I should check it <laughs> to make sure if uh, Greek uh, women have a bigger, um, uh, a bigger risk uh, if this disease is dominated in our country. Uh, Subserosal fibroids when doing IVF, like subserosal fibroids are very much seen in um, uh, in uh, regions such as Africa, uh, to a very big extent, I don't know about, about uh, Greeks uh, and uh, and still miscarriages and no pregnancy. So uh, when doing I have and still miscarriages and no pregnancy. Yeah, I'm not sure that Greek origin has to do with uh, with uh, all of these. I'm sure other countries have. Uh, they have bigger risk into having these, um, all of these together. <laughs> all right, of course. Thank mm -hmm. you indeed for this. I can check that though. It's a good question. If Definitely. It's something interesting to, to find out for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. And actually, there's one more from Angela. Do you offer live birth guarantee packages? Live birth guarantee packages? I'm not sure I understand this question. <laughs> I believe it's about the egg donation programs, for example, if you have an option to like guarantee live birth. Uh... Uh, so we do offer donor um, uh, donor like egg guarantee programs. Yeah. Like, do yeah, you have yeah. any? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, we we have, and we can suggest you. Uh, I would be very happy to discuss this further and give you information if you want on that. Yes. All right. Of course. Understood. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Angela has added, she, she means exactly a package that can guarantee a live, healthy baby. Yeah. This sort of packages. Uh, um, guaranteeing a live, healthy baby, only God could guarantee. <laughs> I hope we could guarantee, but there are very many, many, many different tests that we have in our protocol and during pregnancy um, that would uh, search for any uh, abnormalities during pregnancy and make sure that the baby is healthy to the extent that we can as physicians. Um, All right. Yeah. Understood. Thank you so much. And there is a thank you from Angela. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, if you would like to get more details, uh, just go ahead and get in touch with Agni and her team. Mm -hmm. And let's have a look at the next question that we have from Maria. I had an egg collection the other day and the clinic did the biopsy for PGS on day three. Now I heard someone say that day five is better. What are your thoughts? And there is another question. So I only got three eight cell three day embryos. I'm 41. And what are the chances of at least one embryo good enough for transfer? And of course, let me go to the first part. Okay, first, first part first. <laughs> um, so there is this possibility of checking day three um, and have a biopsy on that. However, 
biopsy at day five or day six uh, during the blastocyst stage uh, is um, mostly used uh, since it's there is a um, less risk to the embryo um, during the biopsy itself. Uh, so uh, I don't know how the result came out, what, what the result came out to be after all. Uh, I three eight cell. I don't know. Sorry, sorry, I don't know either. Yeah. The, <laughs> so uh, yeah, oh, let's let's wait. Yeah, sorry. Let's wait and see what the result uh, from the biopsy that you had already is, and um, the doctor will guide you through the next steps, uh, or else you can always try day five uh, PGS um, preimplantation screening forty one. What are the chances of at least one embryo good enough for transfer? So um, when we do PGS, it's always better to have many embryos uh, because from the biopsy there are, and the screening, there are many different um, outcomes. So having a higher, a bigger amount of embryos being tested, then you have a bigger amount of embryos that would be okay. Uh, the result would be fine, and so the embryo transfer would be um, with two or three embryos at your age. Uh, so th there is a there is a chance that even at least one embryo is good enough for transfer, and if everything else is fine, then um, the percentage of success rate is uh, could be also fair. Doesn't have to be two or three embryos to have a good. Uh, result, you just increase the chances. And again, wonderful. Thank you so much. And actually, one more from Maria. Okay, follow up. Does it mean the clinic is bad or could they have had a reason for doing it? I'm sure they had a reason for doing it. <laughs> right. And thank you for that. Okay, sorry. Just checking. Um, uh, yeah, another question we do have right here. So uh, let me just show you. Of course, there's a thanks from Maria. And the next question, it looks like that might be our... Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, just a few questions left. Sorry, right here is the next one. I also have a low AMH. This is from Danielle, okay? The previous patient uh, about laparoscopy. And only one tube now from the ectopic pregnancy. Have you seen patients with one tube, low AMH, and recurrent implantation failure with six IVF transfers conceiving naturally after a laparoscopy? <laughs> okay. Um, so one tube, low AMH, how low is the AMH? Let's assume that the AMH is very low. Uh, and recurrent implantation failure with six IVF transfer conceived naturally. It's quite difficult, I would say, to have a natural conception with all these factors here. Um, there is always uh, inflammation in our mind because of the ectopic, because of uh, the recurrent implantation failures. Um, a CA125 could show, um, give us a, a... I will show you this, as this is the next part to it, okay? So I have two day six, five AA hatching embryos and one 4BA embryo with me being 35 and 65 transfers. Somewhere double transfer, would you, uh, would you recommend transferring the third? Which one is better? I have two day six and one 4BA. Mm, it's, it's a somewhere double transfer. Would you recommend transfer the third? Which one is better? So that would be a three, I think. So the three of them. The, the three of them. Thank you. Um, so it, it, there are many, many, many different questions I could ask right here to understand and have a picture. It's not a um, yes, I would recommend or not. Um, I would definitely say uh, that you should keep going and have another another attempt and uh, try and see with your doctor if there's anything else you could do um, for the implantation failure. Um, if there is a, a chance of inflammation before doing the embryo transfer 
to increase the chances of implantation. There is another uh, test that you could uh, you could see, and um, it would help exactly. That's what I want to say. The air map, um, uh, NK cells, not so much. With I don't I I I think um, they're not as high in the priority list of of tests. Um, and there is a very big debate for NK cells. Um, however, the air map uh, or the air test uh, it would suggest implantation the window of implantation the implantation window um, by having this test uh, you could be more sure the physician would be more sure when to do the embryo transfer and you could combine a biopsy sent for the air test the air map with a biopsy sent for endometritis and this is uh, how you would have two results from one um, two biopsies, but in one day done, uh, and the results would be out, then you would know if the when the implantation uh, window is good for you. So the medication would be um, given uh, uh, accordingly. And if there is endometritis, endometritis, you would cure it before you do the embryo transfer, increasing the success. That's what we see almost every day in our clinic. There is a, we go through this protocol in that cases, in these cases. And amazing. Thank you so much yet again for your question and your help with that. And mm -hmm. let's uh, have a look. There are like two questions left, I believe. So we will be slowly finishing. So if you have more questions, you can either get in touch with Agni or just go ahead and type those in right now. And the question is, I have heard that my hormone, le hormone levels are good, but I have PCOS. Does that mean that I should get many but bad quality eggs? I only got six eggs in my retrieval. Five were mature. So if the hormone levels are good, um, PCOS is a whole other chapter. Um, it could cause... Uh, low quality of eggs, uh, not necessarily, but there is a chance that the the eggs are affected. But if the hormonal levels are good, uh, they're not disturbed, then um, the chances of affected oocytes from PCOS is also getting lower. Um, however, that I should get uh, many but bad quality eggs. I only got six eggs in my retrieval, five mature. In the end of the day, um, if you have five mature, then go ahead. You only need one to be implanted in your case. And uh, I'm sure that your physician would, would take care of the whole picture of the PCOS, that there are many different protocols for, uh, like always as well for PCOS. And uh, slowly gathering the mature ones and then fertilizing them depending on all the other factors that are surrounded, uh, that are surrounding uh, your case, then it should be successful. It should be fine. The embryo transfer, I mean. And thank you once again, of course, for yet another um, question. And of course, your answer. There is a thank you again here. And next question, very straightforward. So does your clinic have embryo adoption program? Um, yes, we we are. Um, well, there is a, a consent that um, the patients are signing uh, when they start with IVF, one of them would be uh, to donate the embryo for research, another would be to uh, discard it. We are really trying to um, uh, also promote uh, embryo adoption, an embryo adoption program. Um, I would uh, actually like to uh, evaluate this with uh, the um, uh, law department of uh, our clinic and get back to you if you want so that I don't uh, I haven't misunderstood this uh, program that we have so I right. would to answer yeah in well, a further step thank you so much of course yes the go ahead and just get in touch with Agni and I'm sure they will be able to provide you with some more details on that program 
as well. And let's have a look, okay? It uh, might be our last question, okay? So let's go ahead with it. So how does high testosterone impact fertility? I had normal levels, although have recently introduced the HEA supplement, 25 milligrams, and I'm worried this will increase the testosterone level. I will have it retested. Mm -hmm. High testosterone could impact um, folliculogenesis. It could impact the um, the quantity and quality of the eggs as well. The HEA is given sometimes as treatment, um, and it could help. But it all depends on the, what the level of testosterone is already. So, in case of PCOS, for example, uh, if that is the reason of uh, the high testosterone because there are many other reasons endocrinologically wise. I would suggest to have it tested simultaneously with a gynecology of gynecologist, of course, and an endocrinologist and uh, um, see and help you with the, with the levels of testosterone. Certainly it could affect. And once more, thank you a lot for yet another one, of course. And um, in the meantime, one more question has shown right here. So I guess, I guess we can still answer that. So I did hormone tests in March and the retrieval in December. And in between, I started the pill, took maca powder, etc. cetera. Would, uh, could um, my hormone levels have changed, which might have had a negative impact on my treatment? And the retrieval in December, and in between, started the pill took maca powder. I'm not, I am not aware of maca powder, but uh, I, I, I understand what you mean. Could my hormone levels have changed? Yes, uh, from March till December, there are six months, almost uh, more than six months actually, um, nine months uh, in between. So the hormones could have changed. Depends on the on the age. Yes, uh, regulating uh, the hormonal levels. It depends on the age. I'm not certain of the of your age, uh, but uh, if a patient comes uh, with uh, 41, so yes, I would suggest to have another hormonal profile um, if you haven't had one. Uh, the retrieval was in December, and I between started the pill. Yes, uh, have changed, which might have a had a negative impact on my treatment. No, it wouldn't have a negative uh, impact on the treatment. Uh, I, this is not the reason why the treatment was not successful to a big extent. It could help, but it wouldn't uh, sabotage the, the retrieval or the treatment. There are other reasons for that, mainly because of the age and the oocytes and the, the, the DNA of the, of the oocytes gets slightly affected and uh, after the age of 40 the mutations are even higher and there are more of poor quality oocytes doesn't mean that there are no mature ones and not good but there is a bigger risk of having a poor quality oocytes and so not a, as good uh, IVF attempt and wonderful once more thank you a lot for that explanation um yes one more question is from karen here okay do two parts again uh, testosterone was 1.24 and dhea's levels was 4.89 and what with 25 milligrams is this likely to increase testosterone above normal levels not necessarily um, but it depends on the other hormonal uh, levels and the reason uh, that uh, testosterone would be affected, if it's PCO, if it's if it is if there is another reason for that, what are the symptoms there are? So um, it wouldn't affect as much. No, endocrinologist would certainly answer better this question. I'm sure. <laughs> of course. Um, okay, sorry. There's uh, only affected by the HEA supplement. Yes, it depends on how much DHEA supplement, uh, how much and for how long time someone takes DHEA. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone is typing, so 
yeah that's that's it there is a thank you of course from karen and mm -hmm. so thank you a lot again for the explanation to yet another question and as i mentioned we will be finishing uh but of course i want to uh, again add that if you would like to get in touch with agni and her team this is the way to do it let me just send you the link once again and there is an option where you can just get in touch with them and well agni i would also like to thank you so much for joining and spending this friday evening with us i know it's a bit late for you already uh, but i'm very very happy that you uh, still were able to to be here with us and thank you so much for your expertise and for answering all the questions and to everyone else thank you so much for asking all those questions and of course participating in our webinar and um, i do believe it's been very useful to you and um i also want to uh simply um say that to as you know fingers crossed for all of you and uh, i definitely hope to uh, see you back here pretty much soon as well. And Agni, before I let you go, anything else you would like to add? I would like to thank you. The pleasure is all mine being here. I hope that I have answered at least a few questions. Um, uh, I would be very happy to uh, answer uh, more questions if there are, or um, explain further some of the uh, other questions that could arise. And uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, we would be more than happy to, to help you out. Um, really liking the webinars. Thank you very much, Caroline, for inviting me. And I hope the rest of them uh, would go as great as the previous ones. Thank you, indeed, so yeah. much for this. And Agni, I do hope this is just like very first webinar with us. And I just hope that uh, next year we will be back for, with some more webinars for sure. So I do hope to see you here as well. Thank you a lot. And I just also want to mention, as always, that remember, it has been recorded. So you have, if you missed anything or you would simply like to watch the presentation or Q&A once more, this is possible. You will be able to see it on myivfenses.com and also on our YouTube channel. It will be available there tomorrow. And as you know, as I mentioned, we have still some of the webinars left next week is our last week of those webinars this year and i do hope to see you and well now i would uh, like to um simply say have a lovely weekend and i do hope to see you back here on monday we will be back at 8 p.m uk time agni once again huge thanks and also have a wonderful weekend take care everyone good night have a good weekend stay safe and stay positive Exactly. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.